Okay. So, uh, my name is James Watts. I've been introduced like seven times already today, so uh, we'll pass on that. Um, yeah, I'm James Watts. So first off, uh, just a little disclaimer uh, on this talk. Um, you, you might feel a little hungry throughout the talk. I've been very selective about the slides that I've uh, picked, the images I've got. So uh, there's still some food at the back, just in case uh, you're going to need it. So I'm going to be talking about design patterns. Um, so before we get started, just to sort of work out where we're at. Uh, who has heard of design patterns? Yeah, that's good. Started good. Who knows some design patterns? OK, withering down. Who uses design patterns? OK, I think some people didn't know about them and use them. Uh, OK. So the first thing about design patterns is that there are many. There are lots of design patterns. And depending on who you talk to, uh, you might get different versions. So you get different perspectives on how that pattern should best be implemented. And the most important thing about design patterns is that they're not strict. They're ideals. Okay? So let's break it down. What is a design pattern? A design pattern is a common solution to a common problem. So there are a lot of things, a lot of logical issues that you're going to encounter when programming, which people have encountered before you. And we're talking about lots of people who have encountered before you. And they've devised uh, certain designs which will resolve those problems for you. Or they will give you a uh, architecture or they'll give you a design in your code which is going to resolve that problem. Okay? Um, there are lots and they vary. So they tackle different solutions. There are uh, patterns which are geared towards architectural problems. There are patterns which are geared towards logical problems. And even though they come from uh, object-oriented programming, uh, they are everywhere. And they can actually be applied everywhere. And if you're really, really keen, you can actually apply some of them in real life. So, and I mean besides code, so like to your kitchen or something like that. So it all started here. This is a book. And if you're interested in design patterns and you haven't read this, you should get this. Uh, this is a book written by four authors, which are commonly known as the Gang of Four. Uh, these are the guys which basically started it. Uh, they basically got together. They had a lot of ideas. These are pioneers in object-oriented programming. Uh, they put together their base ideas, and they came out with a collection of base design patterns. Since then, more have been devised, and there are some uh, sub-patterns of other patterns, and there are anti-patterns. So it's kind of grown from here. But if you're really into object-oriented programming, this book you should have read. So. Uh, like I said, there are patterns in different areas of programming, and probably the biggest pattern that pertains to us, KPHP developers, is MVC. Okay? This is a pattern which actually appeared in Smalltalk, so this didn't actually uh, come from the Gang of Four. This was actually devised in a really cool language. If you want to check it out, it's called Smalltalk. Uh, it's not around anymore. Um, and it, the MVC architecture is basically a three-tiered architecture. So is there anyone here who doesn't understand MVC. OK, the core, great, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> wow, morale booster there. Um, so let's clarify, OK, and make sure we really understand what MVC is. So MVC, uh, they mean certain things. Uh, the first thing is model, the second thing is view, and the third thing is controller. But do we all really understand what these things are? So do we know what a model is? Do you know what a view is? I mean, if I say to you a view, a lot of people answer me, oh, it's a CTP file. Well, <laughs> it is in Cake, yeah. But a view can actually go further than what it is in Cake. A view in Cake, for example, is usually a HTML file. And you've got your PHP, you've got your procedural PHP in there. Maybe you've got some CSS and JavaScript if you're not doing things properly. Um, but yeah, you're going to have a CTP file. But a view can be a shell interface. That's a view. I'm interacting with it. If I'm interacting with it, it's a view. So this goes further than what it actually is substantially in KPHP. Now, there is another way we can interpret these three tiers. 
and it is to look at them this way. So your model is your business layer, okay? This is where you encounter your business logic. And the understanding of this is, is the lemma of, uh, you know, skinny controllers and fat models. That isn't a guide as to, well, you should just stick all your code in your model. It's, that's not the idea. The idea is, is that you're going to have your business logic, so what drives the application, what the application needs to understand about what it's functioning for, that should be in your model, your business layer. Your view is then your presentation layer. So when you say presentation, it gets broader, because I'm talking about how I'm going to present this to you. How are you going to interface with the, with the business layer? Okay? It's the way, it's the door to getting to your business layer. And then your controller is all about mediation. The controller is the guy which allows you to talk from your view to your model. Okay? Now, these are three tiers, and they're separated. They, they have three different ideals. They serve three different purposes. But do you know what that ideal is? Does anyone here know what the ideal is between three tiers? It begins with S. Separation. Exactly. Separation of concerns. This is the whole reason behind MVC. MVC is about separating your concerns. So you're going to say, well, I don't really care. I'm going to write an application. Uh, I think Jose was saying, you know, we'll get Laravel and just stick it all in one file. You'll be good. <laughs> um, but the idea behind this is it lets you scale. The idea behind MVC, the idea behind design patterns is scale. So you can count a problem, you can resolve it in a standard way, and when another developer comes along and he sees you've used a certain pattern, he's going to be able to interface with that, and he's going to know what he's doing straight away. It's, it really does work like that. You'll sit next to someone, and he knows what your code's doing straight away. So the important thing to remember, if you want to remember three things about how you should be working with MVC, and this will make you code better, is that neither layer wants to know about the other, should know about the other, or can know about the other. These are three guys who don't get along. They want to talk as least as possible. And when you talk to them, you want to be passing as least information as possible. The model doesn't want to know what the controller is doing. The co controller doesn't want to know what the model is doing. In Cake, you see a lot of uh, situations where someone's pulling out a model. They're populating the model. Wrong. Wrong. I don't know how to populate a model from a controller. The controller doesn't understand the model. The controller knows that the model has a method, that it calls and it does something. I don't care what it does, but I know I've got to call it. So don't do that. Don't populate models from your controllers. Okay? Now, I've got quite a few to get through. I'm not gonna, I don't know if I'm going to get through all of these, because my time's I'm like one third through my time already. Um, but I've got the slides if we don't get through it all. Um, next one, uh, front controller. Okay? Don't be confused with this one. This isn't about controllers. The front controller is a design where you have a single point of entry. That's front controller, OK? And uh, we'll avoid the obvious jokes around single point of entry. <laughs> so where do you find these in KPHP? Because we're talking about design patterns, right? But where are these in KPHP? So your front controller is probably where you're least going to look for it. It's not in your controller directory. It's in your web root. The index.php in kphp is the front controller. It's the endpoint that you connect to. When someone connects to your application, this is where the delegation starts. So if you don't reach here, you're not going anywhere. This is like taking off the front door of your house. No one's getting in. Next one, template method. This one is really common in kphp as well. So what does a template method do? A template method allows you to override steps of a process without modifying the process itself. So you're thinking now, OK, I, I know what this is. I know where I'm going. But this has a, um, another ideal behind this, and it begins with H. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Somebody actually, somebody actually uses this uh, where I work. These are also known as hooks. So when you talk to someone and they say, oh, you got an application, where can I hook in? How can I hook up with that? Where's the integration point? 
they're probably looking for template methods. It's a way where I can say, well, if you use this method, it's going to do X to the process. So obvious places in Cake PHP where this happens, before filter and before render. These are hooks. These are template methods. If you don't touch them, process stays the same. You touch them, you can modify the process. Okay? Now, this is in KPHP, but you can apply this anywhere. You're writing JavaScript code. You can create template methods. I have an empty method on an object. It gets called by, by a superior object. If nobody defines it, it doesn't do anything. If I define it, I can change it. Next one up. This is probably one of the most, uh, if you're not new to, a lot of people are not new to design patterns, they usually hear about this one first before they even know what a design pattern is, the factory pattern. Mm. So what does a factory pattern do? Factory pattern allows you to create an object without exposing the instantiation logic. So what does that mean? That means I want to create something, but I don't want to know how it's created. I don't need to know how it's created, and I don't want to know how it's created. So if we do a basic example of this, and this is all going to be really familiar to all of you, usually this is done with person as well, is we have an animal object in our system. Uh, we can create different types of animals. We can create a cat, we can create a dog, or we can create a moose. These are different versions of that object. They do different things. This is the typical example that you see online where you say, well, cat says meow, dog says woof, and moo says, hey, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we abstract that away? Well, we create an animal factory. And this isn't a factory where you literally create animals. This is just going to abstractly create them. So we would have something like create dog. Now, the cool thing about this is I know I'm creating a dog. So from a human perspective of the code, I know what I'm building. But I have absolutely no idea about the instantiation. And I don't need to know. So a lot of the work that goes behind this, I've just totally jumped over. I've just taken one big step over it. And I don't need to know. Now, you can go a little bit further. Sometimes you have factories which allow you to throw in like a configuration array or something like that if you want to you know, change dog. Dog no longer says moo. Dog says, uh, well, dog would say woof. Um, but you get the idea. So there's a place in the HTML helper where there's a really, really good example of the factory. And the cool thing about this is, is like I said, uh, the design patterns can be applied and they don't necessarily have to be about objects. And in this case, they're not. So in the HTML, uh, HTML helper, uh, we have a tag method. Uh, some of you may have used it. Some may not. Now you know it's there. This allows you to create any HTML tag. Now what you notice is that I don't necessarily know how to compose HTML. But I know what kind of tag I'm looking for. So if I'm going to create a P tag, this is going to create a paragraph. Now this is a factory, because I'm able to say, OK, on an abstract level, I want this type of element, but I don't know how it's built. But I don't care how it's built. There is also uh, another thing you can take a look at. This is a little more far out. Uh, this is something that I've been working on called the Cake Toolkit. Uh, this totally revises the view layer in KPHP. And you actually start writing your views as classes. And you start building your view with objects. This is pretty far out as far as factories go. So if you want to see a really, really heavy uh, factory implementation, here you, you'll find one. Utility. You get some idiots out there. Um, sorry, uh, you get some members of the community out there uh, who say that Cake uh, does too much static. OK? And I, I won't call that bullshit, um, but it is. So this is actually a design pattern. Static classes, also known as uh, virtual objects in other languages, uh, allow you to cr uh, create things or do certain operations without instantiation. So I don't need to create an instance of something. I don't need that kind of context. I just need to run an operation. And these tend to be static. Because why am I going to instantiate anything? If I just want to modify a string, what am I instantiating? If you're in Java, you'll have a string object. OK. But in PHP, it doesn't work that way. So uh, I don't know who had the great idea, but they created a directory called utility, which is pretty, uh, 
pretty good because it holds a bunch of classes which follow the uh, utility design. And these are all static classes, which basically provide you a bunch of functionality. So the utility design is really, really simple. Doesn't really need, you don't need any you know, expert understanding of design patterns or object orientation. You just create a static class, and you're actually using the, static, uh, the, um, the utility design pattern. This is the other big one in uh, KPHP. Uh, now, the, the model layer in KPHP is kind of special. You, you probably all know that right now. Uh, if you've dabbled with more hardcore ORMs like uh, Doctrine, you'll know that there are big differences in how they work and how you interface uh, with that kind of abstraction. Uh, KPHP does follow the active record model, uh, but because it's not object oriented, it's not full out. Uh, but if you want to see you know, different implementations, like Jose said, you know, play around with different things, check out Doctrine. Uh, that does a more heavy-ended uh, way of doing active record and a more true to the, to the, um, to the religion of active record. <laughs> so uh, active record is ORM. Uh, for those of you who have been out there preaching ORM and don't know what it means, it means object relational mapping. Uh, but uh, this database row equals an object. Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're abstracting the database, so we're treating the database as a collection of objects, and that allows me to uh, logically and functionally interact with the database. Uh, so you have the SQL uh, scripting language, but sometimes you want to do this in an object-oriented fashion. That is when you would use ORM. The slight difference with uh, KPHP is they're not objects, they're arrays. Uh, now, just one thing that I wanted to clarify, and now that we're being recorded, is that a lot of people call KPHP out for using arrays. That's bullshit. It makes no difference. It's if you're using arrays or using objects, it makes absolutely no difference. And if anyone has an understanding of the Zend engine and what's going on underneath, it's all arrays. You're working with an object in, KP in PHP, it's an array. So there's no substantial evidence for why it's bad for working with arrays and working in objects unless you're really hardcore and you want to have an object that has methods. But then you can use the utility pattern. So there's no big deal. And what does this provide us when we use an ORM? Well, uh, this has been thrown around quite a bit today. Uh, Jippy? Uh, <laughs> CRUD means create, read, update, delete. Uh, this is basically your standard interface. So when you're using an ORM, what you're doing is you're interfacing, and you usually, usually, only do four operations. There are more operations that you can do, but it goes more into a full abstraction of databases, and it's not really relevant here. So the most obvious place that we find the active record pattern in KPHP is the model class. Pretty obvious. Uh, and like I said, KPHP has its own kind of uh, Inter interpretation of the uh, active record, but it's good. And it does kind of follow design, so you're not going to have a, a really big problem. Decorator. This is probably one that you may have heard knocked around a bit. The decorator pattern allows you to add behaviors to an object. Uh, so it allows you to modify an object without modifying other instances of that object. So <coughs> Just so we're all on the same level, you, when you have a class that's called a class schema, it's, it's like a blueprint. It defines what the object is going to be when you instantiate it. Now, if you instantiate that class multiple times, you have multiple objects. But you can modify an object without modifying the other instances, so without modifying the schema. That is when decorators come in. Because sometimes you want two versions of something, so the same thing, but you want this to have other behaviors, you want it to do other stuff, or you want it to do certain things that the other thing does, but a little different. Uh, these are also known as mixin or traits. And if you've been following you know, the, the recent versions of uh, PHP, you know that natively we now have traits in our class schemas, which is pretty cool. And they're actually using that in Cake 3 now as well. So. Uh, and in KPHP, uh, where we see that is in the behaviors. When you use a model behavior, what you're doing is you're decorating your model. You're changing how the model is functioning. You're changing its underlying purpose. 
Okay, but you're not changing. If you had two instances of the model, you can have a behavior on one and not a behavior on the other, and they will do different things. So it's a pretty uh, it's pretty sweet um, design to have. This is probably the design pattern, the singleton, uh, and this is the easiest one to describe because everyone gets it. So single there can only be one. There's only allowed one instance. So where we said before there's a class schema, and you can have instances of that class, with singleton you're only going to get one. Where do we find that? There's only one request. When you come into KPHP, when you're making a request to the application, you only have one request object. If you make a, a sequential request, it's a new request. It's a new instance of what you're doing. So it has absolutely nothing to do with this, with this context. So there's always only one request, and there's always only one response. There are slight exceptions. So uh, if you've dabbled around a bit, you may have used the class registry. Uh, this is a collection of singletons, also known as a multiton. So this is how you have multiple single instances of something. And basically, if you've ever used a class registry, it allows you to uh, register an object to a token, and then you can recuperate that object at a later time. Strategy. Uh, this one actually isn't very well known, but it's really, really practical. When you know this one, you're going to use your uh, configure a lot more, because you can do some really cool stuff. So what this does is it allows you to change a process. So not, not as we did before, where we changed a step of a process. It allows you to change a whole process based on criteria. So what does that mean? It means we have a common interface to something, but we can have the variable processes around that common interface. So some of you already got in your head what I'm going to show for KPHP. The dreaded ACL component. This is a strategy all the way. It even actually says it in the, uh, in the comment, I think. Uh, it uses a strategy pattern. So, uh, so you know I'm not lying. I'm not making this up. Uh, so what does the, how does the ACL component do that? Well, you switch the process of how someone is being, uh, how you're going to uh, query permissions on someone based upon the criteria that's coming in. So this is a strategy pattern. It's not extremely obvious from the code. This is a strategy pattern. But like I said before with the configure, if you have a configure write and you have uh, first keys, and inside those keys you have a, a second level of keys, you can switch the first key to get different collections of secondary keys. So it allows you to switch stuff out. So sometimes you're building applications uh, where you may have a variable view. Based upon the person that's coming in or the product that's being looked at, you may have a different menu, for example. Well, a really great way to switch out the menu is with a strategy pattern. Adapter. Some of you may have already bought these. What does this do? This adapts an interface. So it allows you to uh, interact with something that is foreign to your current interface, but it adapts it so you can deal with it in the same way you do your other interfaces. And this is a process called normalization. Uh, and this is a process that happens across a lot of, if you're an API designer, you're really familiar with this. Normalization is your creed. It's what you do. And these are also known as wrappers. So we have wrappers in KPHP. Data sources. Data source is a wrapper. It's a way that I can interface with another API, which is totally foreign to KPHP. No idea how that works. But we adapt it so that KPHP does know how to interface with that API. And this is when you, when you start going pretty far out with KPHP, this is probably where you have a lot of fun because you can do some really cool stuff. Uh, oh, and I'm, I am good, good for time. Uh, so, Observer. Uh, if you haven't played around a lot with the features in KPHP 2, you probably haven't encountered this. The Observer pattern is basically about notifications. It's about, it's about messaging. It's about communicating. And it's about communicating state change. 
So when I have an, uh, an observer pattern, what I'm doing is I'm having a, a standard way of communicating to another object that something has changed. So where do we see this in KPHP2? It's event-driven. So we have an event system in KPHP, and it's pretty cool. And this is entirely built on one pattern, the observer pattern. If you've worked with uh, Node.js, you're really going to be familiar with the observer pattern. If you've worked with any event-driven environment, which is very different to procedural environment, then you're going to be familiar with this as well. Um, and I thought I was going to run out of time, but that's all I got. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. Have I left you all stunned? <laughs> no? We good? Anyone want to add a pattern that I may have missed? If you're going to an island and you could only take one pattern, which one would you take? <laughs> uh, I'd take a food factory. <laughs> Okay. Huh? I don't know that one. Right. Okay. So the class registry that we're talking about, when you want to instantiate models on the fly, that's the flyweight pattern. I don't. I don't call it the flyweight pattern. I. I call it the class registry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no one else? We good? Okay, let's take a break. <laughs>